Did you know that women in ancient Egypt had almost equal rights and could run their own businesses? Hello and welcome to World History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and today's video is all about the lives of women in ancient Egypt. Don't forget the easiest way to support us is by giving this video a thumbs up, subscribing to our channel and hitting that bell icon for notifications so you don't miss out on any new uploads. World History Encyclopedia is a non-profit organization and you can find us on Patreon, a brilliant site where you can support our work and receive exclusive benefits in return. Your support helps us create videos twice a week. So make sure to check it out via the pop-up in the top corner of the screen or via the Patreon link down below. In ancient Egypt, the central cultural value was mart, or harmony. This concept of harmony was for all aspects of life, and balance could be seen throughout the government, religious practices, art and architecture, and even the gender roles of the civilization. Compared to many other ancient cultures, women had it pretty well off in ancient Egypt. They were fairly equal in all things, except for their occupations, where men were in positions of authority, like part of the government, the king, a general, and head of the family, the women worked in domestic spheres. With that being said, women still held considerable autonomy, power, and authority. Women could marry who they wanted, then choose to divorce them. They could hold land and property, they could travel, and to some extent, choose their profession. Not to mention, female deities oversaw important responsibilities in ancient Egyptian religion, or, as it is known today, mythology. There are many different ancient Egyptian creation myths, but in the most popular one, either Atum or the goddess Neith, begins creation at the primordial mound, surrounded by the primordial waters, personified as Nu and Naonet. Even from the very beginning, it was a balance of female and male principles. This harmony would be continuously upheld between the genders, and following the creation of the universe and the beginning of time, women continued to be regarded as important. Women's pivotal role can be seen in the myth of Osiris and Isis, where it was up to Isis to bring her brother-husband back to life, and who gives birth to Horus, and raises him to be king. Not only that, but Isis is helped by other goddesses, including Nephthys, Serket, and Neith, to restore balance to Egypt after Osiris' brother, Set, usurped power. The goddess Tenenet was the goddess of beer, the drink of the gods, and also provided the Egyptians with the recipe to brew it. Other notable goddesses are Seshat, the goddess of the written word and librarians, Tayet, the goddess of weaving, Hathor, the goddess of joy, celebration and the afterlife, Bastet, a protector of women, the home and women's secrets, and Tefnut, the goddess of moisture. The goddess Kebhet, daughter of Anubis, brought cool, refreshing water to the souls of the dead awaiting judgment. And a number of other goddesses, like Nephthys, were also associated with the afterlife and comforting the souls of the departed. Egyptian religion honoured and elevated the feminine, so it is hardly surprising that women were important members of the clergy and temple life. Women were able to hold important religious positions, with the most important being God's wife of Amun, a position that began in the Middle Kingdom of Egypt between 2040 and 1782 BCE. There were actually many different God's wives positions for numerous deities, and the God's wife of Amun was just one of them. The title was initially just an honorary one, given to a woman who helped the high priest with ceremonies and tended the god's statue. But through the New Kingdom of Egypt, between 1570 and 1069 BCE, the position increased in prestige, until eventually the woman holding the position of god's wife of Amun was equal in power to a king, and essentially balanced the power held by the high priest of Amun. In the clergy, women could also be priests, usually of a female deity's cult, as well as scribes. There were also wise women who were skilled at interpreting dreams, which was an important role considering the Egyptians' belief that dreams were portals to the afterlife and a plane where the dead and the gods could communicate with the living. It 
It was not only as clergy that women could hold respected positions in society, oh no. Once a woman completed her training and became a scribe, they could choose to become a priestess, but they could also become a teacher or a physician. In fact, female doctors were highly respected in ancient Egypt. However, becoming a scribe was long, hard work. So most men and women who became scribes probably came from a family of scribes and followed the occupation of their mother or father. If a woman didn't become a scribe, they could be employed as bakers, weavers, brewers, cooks, or mistresses of the house, which is the modern equivalent of an estate owner, just to name a few. Women were, in fact, the first beer brewers of Egypt. Pretty impressive considering it was believed to be the drink of the gods. The property of a family descended from mother to daughter, and if a woman's husband died or they got divorced, she would be able to run the home how she saw fit. Another occupation for talented women was that of a concubine, which shouldn't be understood as simply a woman used for sex, but a woman who had to be accomplished in music, conversation, sewing and weaving, culture, fashion and the arts. Women in ancient Egypt were autonomous, legally capable citizens who didn't require any sort of supervision or approval from the man in their life. And this extended to family life. Marriages weren't arranged by a male guardian as they were in many other ancient cultures. And women could not only choose their partner, but could also divorce when they pleased. Although a lifelong marriage was preferred, there wasn't any stigma attached to a woman who had divorced her husband. Couples in ancient Egypt before marriage would enter into a prenuptial agreement that ultimately favoured the woman, since if the man asked for the divorce, he lost all right to sue for the gifts he had offered for the marriage, known as the virginity gift. He also had to pay alimony to his ex-wife, either until she remarried or requested that the payment stop. If there were any children in the marriage, the child always went with the mother. The Ebers Medical Papyrus that dates to circa 1542 BCE contains a passage about birth control that includes a prescription to stop a woman becoming pregnant, and both birth control and abortions were available for married and unmarried women. Although the virginity gift suggests that the virginity of a woman at the time of marriage was important, it wasn't a requirement for marriage. Reliefs, paintings and inscriptions depict husbands and wives eating together, dancing, drinking and working the fields with one another. So although Egyptian art was pretty stylized, it does suggest that many ancient Egyptians enjoyed happy marriages. It wouldn't be a complete video on women in ancient Egypt without looking at the queens and royalty. The queen and lesser wives of the Egyptian king would have lived incredibly luxurious lives. The palace of Amenhotep III, the father of Akhenaten and grandfather of Tutankhamun, spread over 30,000 square meters and had spacious apartments, a throne room and receiving hall, libraries, gardens, kitchens, conference rooms, and of course, a temple to the god Amun. It was in places like this that concubines and royal women would live. The pharaoh could have multiple queens, although the extent of the roles of the Egyptian queens is often difficult to establish, but there would always be one, the most important, that would be elevated to principal wife. The principal wife took on duties regarding the affairs of the state and acted as a diplomat. These principal queens would help run the country whilst caring for their family. When Akhenaten focused all of his attention on his new monotheistic religion, his wife Nefertiti assumed his responsibilities and ran the state. For most queens though, their activities remain either undocumented or untranslated. But based on what is available, these queens exerted substantial influence over their husbands, their courts and the day-to-day -day operation of the government. We know of queens of Egypt all the way back to the early dynastic period with Queen Merneith, who ruled as regent for her son in circa 3000 BCE, and Sobek Nefru, who took the throne in the Middle Kingdom. Of course, there is also Hatshepsut, who went so far as to pick herself as a pharaoh with a headdress and beard, and who continues to be considered one of the most powerful women of the ancient world and one of the greatest Egyptian pharaohs. 
The last Queen of Egypt before it was annexed as a province of Rome was Cleopatra VII, a woman who ruled her country far better than many of the men of the Ptolemaic dynasty before her and although not an Egyptian, fully embodied the power and strength of Egyptian women that had been recognised for millennia. Do you know of other ancient societies where women had as much power? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on our new videos every Tuesday and Friday. This video was brought to you by World History Encyclopedia. For more great articles and interactive content, head to our website via the link below. If you like my shirt, you can find this design and a bunch more at apricusclothing.ca. I will also leave a link for it down below under the merch tab. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you soon with another video.